The concept of woman being a business woman. How new it is? It's just an extended of a concept or notion that started long time ago. I had the opportunity to be an entrepreneur at heart. I need to explore if I can do it myself as well. We don't have proper trainings for leaders. Sometimes women are underestimated. Have you watched the movie Devil Wears Prada? I was a bankrupt one time. My job is great, my title's lovely, I'm making great money. But it doesn't matter what I do. You're like a business therapist. <laughs> Motherhood was the very big motivation. One million dollar question, right? <laughs> <laughs>
two years, if I remember correct. Mm. So this gave me the opportunity to see what things are about, not only for women, but for all the people who want to be part of an ecosystem, but they don't have the opportunity. And this is where I took my inspiration and said, I want to be more into that because I really, really love this. Why? Why did you leave your position that other people are dreaming of? to work on your own, to go in your own, uh, on your own way and create your own practice? I think that's the most uh, asked Ask question, question. <laughs> <laughs> the <Why>? la- later <laughs> few months uh, that I established my own company. Uh, I have another question to you. Have you watched the movie Devil Wears Prada? Yeah, yeah. It's an interesting <laughs> movie that everyone wants to work, you know, everyone is dreaming of that job. But yeah, it's, I guess it's that. So in a, nutshell, in a nutshell, that was my life for 15 years. Oh, I'm, I'm kidding. Uh, half kidding, half not. Um, but we always see what is on the set and we see the beauty and we see the fashion shows and we think that it is a glamorous life that everyone lives in a big leading luxury corporations. The truth is that you work day and night and you think about your job every second of your life. If you're sleeping, if you're waking up, if you're with your kids, if you're with your partner. So it is the job that demands a lot. It's not always luxury when you wake up and three o'clock in the morning, you're taking the first flight at six o'clock in the morning and then you're back at 11 and home. And the next day you're again going to the, to the next plane to build the store or to visit the new location or to recruit the new team. So it is very, very extremely demanding, challenging, and it requires all your life. So I decided after 15 years, no matter how glamorous and luxury my job is, I want to live my life. (laughs) So I must tell you, as an entrepreneur of 19 years, I don't know if there is uh, on the other side that the life is any better. Yeah, you do work for yourself. That is huge satisfaction, right? When you have your purpose and your work. But thinking about your job and your company while you're with your kids, while you're with your partners and traveling, I think it's very similar. But yeah, I understand. You um, were in the corporate world. I don't want to mention the name of the company, but it's very well-known brand. Your career was sorted. You had your place there. You had your consistency in the career you had everything sorted and then you decided to change completely the direction and go into something new something that has nothing to do with your career and create your own purpose-driven brand that help parents to be happy parents connected parenting what was the motivation what happened why did you change your career motherhood (laughs) <laughs> All right. <laughs> Motherhood uh, was the very big motivation because it um, started with after I actually had my daughter and um, went back from maternity leave. I was lucky to have eight months of maternity leave, which gave me a good time with her. But when I came back and I started to reflect on what it actually feels like to start off as as a mom and and parenthood in general and what it felt like to start off in the corporate world i saw a huge difference because if you think about it in the corporate world there is a lot done for you as an employee Mm -hmm. you come with a full education um, you uh, get to train your skills attending trainings and workshops to really become better at at your job or in your job Whereas when I reflected on the parenting part, despite the much bigger responsibility we have of raising a human being and helping them launch into this complex world, we are often left without any proper guidance, without um, a proper education or knowledge, and just thrown into the water and having to navigate our way through you know, first keeping this baby alive and then navigating through every different phase that comes along that changes almost every six months. Absolutely. It's true. I've never thought about it. Yeah. You have two responsibilities. The main one is your kids and then your business. And then we do all that self-development when it comes to business. And then with kids, we just experiment. Yes. Right, especially with the first one. There's a lot of experimentation going. Absolutely. And we learn as we go and there is no manual. And um, that would really motivated me to 
um, become part of a, of a dramatic shift in family support. And uh, that's when I um, was moved to uh, research and, and look for a parent coaching institute that was very, very new at that time still. Um, and uh, yeah, that's where my journey started. And I, I never looked back. <laughs> Great. Are there a lot of challenges now when you're running your own business now in, in that field? Yeah. I mean, for me, having been in the corporate world for 11 years, you know, and, and having worked since I was 19, having that monthly salary come in yeah. every month and uh, knowing that, yes, I have my hours to work and I have my projects to finish and then the salary will come anyways every month. That was a, in the aftermath, I realized that was a, um, a calming feeling, you know, yeah. that I didn't have to, to bother um, about. So not having a steady income was a big challenge for me to accept um, in the beginning, uh, despite the very big support I had of my husband, of being able to actually leaving the corporate world, to to dive into uh, becoming an entrepreneur. Uh, he fully supported me and still is um, along the way. So I'm very thankful for that. But apart from that, it's as well being so many departments at the same time, having to do networking, having to focus on your marketing, having to focus on your sales. Um, maybe you're not in the mood to network, you know, but you have to do it anyways, because that's part of your different departments of be, being an entrepreneur. So I think that that were challenges for me to be able to create a structure and because in the corporate in a corporate job you have a structure yeah. you know you have yeah. your to-do list you come in the morning you have your job description um, and everything gives you a certain structure already in place but knowing what i want to do is fine but then how do i bring it to life yeah. how, what do i want to communicate um, first of all, in the beginning, when I started working with parents, I wasn't sure what I really want to focus on. Do I want to, what do I want to specialize in? That took a big, big moment for me to really understand I cannot help every parent in this world and I don't, I cannot focus on every challenge they have. What is it that I really want to focus on specifically? You know? Yeah, I think, I think two things that help a lot of people who change from the corporate to entrepreneur is having a bit purpose. So you just don't do it just for the money that, you know, mm -hmm. bigger purpose, which you have mm -hmm. is absolutely great. It makes you, you know, motivated mm -hmm. to move forward and being focused. I think it's a great, it's a great advice, really. Yeah. Being focused makes a big difference. Yeah. And you know what your niche and what are you all about? And people can understand you better. I know with you, you've never wanted to be an entrepreneur. That's true. Right? That's you true. never <laughs> wanted to leave corporate <laughs> world. You felt safer there. How is this possible? Well, yeah, that's true. I didn't want to have my own business ever. Um, and I think that just came from just being a commitment phobe. <laughs> um, I felt like I had a lot more freedom working for a company where I could leave every any day. Uh, I could resign, no strings attached, no salaries depended on me, nothing depended on me. Um, but when I met my business partner, who actually um, had the idea of Sprout and was starting, we were starting to talk about it. It was the first time I did have an itch that I wanted to do something that mattered. And I kept repeating that for like a couple of years. I said, okay, my, my job is great. My title's lovely. I'm making great money, but it doesn't matter what I do. It just doesn't matter. It's too late to become a doctor, that's for sure. <laughs> um, but I, I, I had this itch, you know, where I was like, maybe I can go to a nonprofit, but there are just too many strings attached. Um, when I met my business partner, though, it was clear that she just came to me with this idea and she said, listen, I want to make kids food. Um, I want to make kids food based on data, based on science. We know what's healthy right now, not through the biggest, you know, most influential blogger, not through, uh, I don't know, pediatricians who mind you, doctors are not trained in nutrition at all, but we have science and we have data and we know how to minimize a lot of these diseases that are the top killers in the world. So I want to do this for children, like start slate, clean the palate. And I was like, yes, this is brilliant. 
this is what we should be doing. We need to, to save, in quotes, the future generation instead of making it sicker. And, and these people, these children end up becoming 30, 40, 50 like us and who are constantly on pills and on medication and doctor's visits. This is really, I felt like this was really a calling for me to just make, that, make a difference, at least have some kind of impact into the future. What it means to be a global collaboration strategist? A global collaboration strategist is someone who actually is looking at a business and understanding who are the right business partners to engage with, mm -hmm. how to really monetize it for success. It's as simple as that. You know, I think so many people everywhere you go, you hear, you're right, collaborate, collaborate, collaborate. But where are you learning how to collaborate? You learn in school to work together as a team. Sometimes in some schools, we don't even learn that. You don't even learn that, right? So these are not skills that actually are being taught, yeah. you know, where you're embracing it in, in, in the work environment. And as you enter the work environment, you know, there's a competition that exists. So like, how do you collaborate successfully when you're an entrepreneur? You don't have a ton of money necessarily to invest in lead generation. And so that's where collaboration becomes key to your success. Do you have any online courses or a book or, you know, mentorship programs that you offer the entrepreneurs who have small companies just starting maybe? Mm, well, I do the business therapy. Tell me what it is actually, business therapy. So, what it is. So basically business therapy was created. A client of mine, I was helping consult and they said, you're like a business therapist. <laughs> you're just helping me. You're letting us talk. And it's an opportunity for people right, in business to talk about their problems. And there's no doubt that there are a ton of problems that exist in businesses. And there's really no opportunity for, or a lack of opportunity of where to get those problems solved, how to actually get them out. So depending on the size mm -hmm. of the business will depend on the opportunity that is presented. And sometimes in medium and small businesses, there's nowhere to actually yeah. just release this. And I always say the best is to get it out of your head, yeah. write it down, and then figure out it's going to be less stressful once it's out of your head. And when you're speaking about it, sometimes that offers a great opportunity for solutions because then you're looking at it from a different perspective and you're able to kind of think about it in new ways that you may have not have, you know, experienced if it was just sitting up in the brain in the, you know? in the, or here in your heart people yeah. are affected by this in so many different ways and it may be physically it may be emotionally you know and it definitely is mentally so if i could provide a platform for people to get this out of their body you know it's all sitting in their nervous system it's all in the somatic system so that they can just release it just by communicating and talking about it it shifts yeah we're all energy you yeah. know so it's just shifting into another level and if i can objectively see a solution and provide a step-by-step -step way of solving the problem is not the, the best. Charlotte, I, I'm, I think you have a very, very powerful vision. Very, very powerful, incredible vision. I think we need more visions like that in this world. <laughs> Tell me, please, how did you find it? How did you get to this vision? Uh, thank you. Thank you for uh, mentioning that. And it's not something that I really found or I mm. had to work on to find mm. my own purpose, my own vision. It's actually by being a leader for uh, more than 15 years in a corporate environment. Um, empathic leadership, a leader that actually has emotions within, within the business is super important and super crucial. And when I came to the Middle East... Um, in a, in a multinational, what I really found, what I was missing in a lot of customers and a lot of companies I went to and I saw was that we don't have proper trainings for leaders. We don't have, and not training like a tick in the box exercise, but a training that really empowers that leader, that gives that leader like, what is it to be empathic? A long-term mm -hmm. value out of a training or out of a coaching. So that's why actually I started my own business mm -hmm. two years ago. And the purpose for me is to yeah, make sure that the leaders are empathic, that the leaders are happy, but that they also are high performing. And high performing is not only number driven. Number driven. Uh -huh. um, so, and if they are that, they will then bring that to the next generation. They will bring that to their team members. And if their team members feel empowered, feel inspired, they will bring that to the next level. So I feel that even if I help only a few high level leaders, they bring it and they have that ripple effect to the next and the next. So that's why my mission is and my vision is to empower thousands. You created the C-Treat, an amazing event that help actually with self-awareness. 
Yes. I'd like to know a little bit more. Okay, let me let me shortly touch upon that. So it's a retreat. Yeah. But we call it C treat with the big C, C because yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, C for Become, my business. Yeah. But C as well, it's the sign is like an ear. And active ah. listening starts ah. with like everything starts with an, with active listening. If you okay. can active listen, you become much more self-aware. But let's go back to retreat. So the retreat calls C treat, and it's because you want to be. I want to have people that are now maybe in a C suite position. They are leaders. They are the CEO of their business or the CEO of their teams. But are they the CEO of their minds? And mm. to be self-aware, you need to be the CEO of your mind. You need to understand how your mind I works. I think the mind is our CEO. Yeah. I would say even the and it owner, the, the chairman and everything. Yes. <laughs> the investor. <laughs> and besides yeah. your mind, you have your body, right? Yeah. Do you it's take really CEO. care of your body? If you want to be a high-performing manager, a high-performing CEO, and a happy high-performing, right? Because I love to have the happiness in there. You need to know how your body works and what your body needs. And that is exercise, that is healthy food, that is enough sleep. That is no caffeine after lunchtime because caffeine stays 12 hours in our body. Like, for instance, it's all small things that will help you to be healthier with your body. And if your body is healthy, your mind will get healthy. And if your mind is healthy and you know when to switch off, when to be creative, when to relax, you will become a much better CEO of your business. It automatically is automatically happens so let's first work on ourselves so my retreat is also about the first part of the retreat is is purely on clarity getting your purpose knowing yourself know who you really are and then we go further on to the ceo of your business so you will go you go back home with some business tools some what can you do different as a leader mm. like how can you even more grow even if you are on this level there will be there will be things that you can still learn to grow. I know you had an amazing, uh, amazing career in corporate world. Why did you move from the corporate world to, to your own thing? And why podcasts? Having an opportunity to explore how it can work when mm. you are a founder uh, gave me a lot of exposure into uh, a totally different world for me. I think podcasting came naturally. Mm -hmm. When I started sort of networking within that environment, I decided I need to explore mm. if I can do it myself as well. But I mean, behind that desire was probably I was looking for the way to create content regularly because I think content is a great way to connect to your audience, educate your clients yeah. and also build a personal brand. So that's why I started it. I came up with the idea uh, to organize the um, conference devoted to projects supporting women and uh, it happened so that there are a lot of brands that you work with you invited to your podcasts we all surrounded by these brands in our everyday life uh, and every company uh, has their own project or initiative uh, that should support women in companies. And my idea was to see uh, what's that? What what do they do? How do they support? Uh, some companies launch the program of equal pay. Other companies uh, organized a club inside their, I don't know, their HR department or somewhere there uh, just to help women to contact with each other and uh, get some daily motivation and inspiration. So there were absolutely different kind of projects. And what we did, we bring them all together uh, our idea was to share best practices and to bring female female leadership leaders and entrepreneurs together uh, to be to feel empowered and to get inspired. Just and the idea and the mission of our conference is just to help women feeling like yes, you can. Time is now. Just do it. You can. Uh, you see the examples of other women working in global companies or entrepreneurs. They did it. So so. You, you can, can you can do the same. Uh, that's one uh, thing. And another thing is about equality itself. And uh, mm, if we talk about equal rights, it is actually about um, have equal opportunities and to be treated fairly. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's the problem because sometimes um, women are underestimated. Some companies keep special positions for men because they feel like uh, there should be a man candidate and they mm, promote it like this, like we're finding a proper man. Uh, so <laughs> so yeah. whether you're trying to find a good professional or you're trying to find a man, that's the, that's the question. I've 
read um, two days ago, no, yesterday, I think, right before uh, discussing our podcast, that uh, it was, I think, in Arabian business. Mm -hmm. The idea of that for women entrepreneur is still difficult in the Middle East mm -hmm. to deal with the investors and raise money. Mm. I haven't had that feeling, to be honest. Um, I don't know, maybe it's, the, uh, maybe it's the type of people I spoke to. But did you feel that? Do you feel that? Um, I, I do, definitely. You do? <laughs> yeah, we've been in some very uncomfortable, awkward situations where we have had to either defend things that we defend things about Sprout or defend things about ourselves, which 100% would have never come up if we were male. Like, um, can you share like parenthood. With us? Like I'm, but, I'm very involved with other, I'm very involved with other women entrepreneurs in the region yeah. too, and startups and just we'll meet randomly, um, every now and then. And you'll hear some of the, even the stories that they get. But, uh, I mean, we've been, I've been asked questions, but, but this has happened to me also on interviews, not necessarily only with investors to be clear. Um, but I've been asked, so what do you do if your baby gets a fever? And I said, I don't know. What do you do when your baby gets a fever? Yes. Sir. I, I, how do I, <laughs> there's no right or wrong answer. So I'm going to let my baby fry. Is that okay? I'm, I will be here. Like, what is the right answer? You yeah, know, what is the right answer? I don't know. I have three nannies. Like, there's no right yeah, answer. Don't worry. It doesn't bother so, me. Yeah. At all. Like, I don't know how to answer that question. There's no right or wrong. And also it would never, ever have been phrased to a man. Um, and that's, I mean, that's just one random example, but there has been tidbits where, I think, especially because most of the investors are men, it's really interesting. But I find that as a challenge. Like, how do we get them to see our side? Because at the end of the day, we're 50% of the population. So at some point, somebody has to sell to us, right? <laughs> so, so it's really about if you can persuade somebody like that to get on your side, I think you're solid. You know, not, not beg, again, not beg, not please, I can do this. It's more like, this is the story. This is why Sprout was created. There's a reason behind it. And he, there's a huge market waiting for it, you know? Yeah. And that's, then there's no reason, there's no doubts there. But I have found it a little bit to be a little bit more difficult here um, to be in business than other areas of the world where I've worked. Do you really believe that there is a balance between being a good parent mm -hmm. and being successful entrepreneur um, or businessman? I would say life is messy as such, right? <laughs> and our days <laughs> and, and our days are extremely busy. Um, I think we have to ask ourselves, what is balance for me? You know, what do I expect mm -hmm. uh, from from myself as a as a business or woman or entrepreneur? And what do I expect from myself as a parent? And I think, of course, we can create intention there and um, approach our routine in an intentional way and build it uh, along our our day. Um, but balance, uh, it's our days are not often happening as we wish them to happen, right? Uh, as you just told me earlier, you had so many uh, to-dos on your list and um, at, at the same time your kids are sick, you have to attend to them. Um, yeah, so w it's often as well about flexibility. You're a mother of three <laughs> businesses and three kids. <laughs> I is there, <laughs> I can, is there really balance? Honestly, truly, is there balance for mother of three and a great career like you have and an inspirational model for a lot of women? Is there true balance in life? Uh, and how do you do that with three kids? Beautiful, amazing kids. Thank you, thank you, Nina. Um, I think uh, it is another stereotype that modern women uh, can do all of these uh, aspects: uh, health, uh, mm -hmm. sport, uh, career, family, everything at once. Uh, it never happens so, and uh, it's a stereotype. And if you hear uh, someone saying "Yes, I can," do not believe this woman. <laughs> um, and for me. Um, uh, what I do, I usually focus on three aspects of my life. For instance, I choose a career, um, sport, and uh, family values. And uh, I focus on these three for approximate, I, I would say, like uh, three or four or five months. And then I do a refresh, a refresh oh. just to analyze whether I should choose something else. Since we're discussing this thing about ideas that we all, you know, entrepreneurs,
course, everyone is an entrepreneur now, which is yeah. great. It's good to be independent. Yeah. And, uh, but we discussed this idea about a lot of people have ideas and then what, right? Yeah. In your case, the business was not your idea. Yep. Yeah. It was not. You got excited and took it forward, yeah. right? Yeah. So the whole thing is how how important is to have an idea or what is more important actually? Yeah. To act on it. Yeah. So it's interesting that you say that because I have a lot of people who come to me and say, Oh, you're a co founder, so whose idea was it? Mm. And I'm like, Well, it was it was my business partner. She um she has a degree she's a biochemist by education. She had this idea. Uh, we met very early on. She wanted to bring me on board and we made it happen. It's fast forward three years later. We're still in business. Now we're building out the health tech part of it. The, it's growing as an idea um, and as a concept. We're basically, we're, we're t we've taken all the steps we want to take it where we want it to go. But I get that a lot where people say, oh, it wasn't your idea. And I said, no, I've never really... I've never really been an idea person. I'm a doer. Like if you give me anything to produce, I will get it done. No complaints, head down, I'll find a way, I'll get it down. I'm a hustler, <laughs> let's put it that way. Um, so I didn't feel, and I, I feel a lot, a lot of people will tell me, oh, but I wish I had an idea so I could do something. An idea is really, that's it, it's an idea. Unless you bring the team around it, unless you get the right team and the right traction around it, and you have the right story to your brand, nothing will happen. It's just an idea. How many times do you hear people say, oh, that idea, Facebook, I thought of Facebook five years before it came out. <laughs> I thought of Google three years before it came out. And it's like, yeah, okay. we all thought about it at some point, you know, yeah. but it, it's irrelevant who thought about it, who actually made it happen, because that's where the work really comes into it. I don't think I've ever met anyone who's been in that role for so long. So for me, it's also <laughs> going to be a discovery today. That's why it changes so many countries, right? To make it always interesting and engaging. <laughs> and more than that, today you're not just um, ju not just in the field of the um, buying and merchandising, right? You have a much bigger agenda now. You have your own podcast, you're empowering women, you support women entrepreneurs. So we have a lot of things in common. Absolutely. I try to do my best, yes. But after 20 years, of telling the stories of brands within retail I told myself uh, why keeping the conversation within retail so I decided to take the conversation beyond, beyond retail and discover that there's a story behind every one of us excellent thank you thank you I want to ask you one question and I think it's going to be the question straight away I don't keep Shoot. it to the end I'll just <laughs> do it straight away so you go and see hundreds of products, right? Hundreds of brands. How do you know which one to choose? How do you know that this is the product over, you know, that you want for your company rather than those stands that are also available? One million dollar question, right? <laughs> and then we know I that <laughs> all the secrets and... <laughs> Success story. Um, well, as you said... Uh, dozens, hundreds of products being released uh, on a daily basis. And nowadays, the market is so overloaded, mm. is so saturated by everything. So to really find the gap in the market, whether it's a product or a service, because at the end, the same approach applies throughout. It's here, it's really a, a treasure hunt. Yes. And you need to have that, uh, that vibe, that enthusiasm, that passion, but at the same time, a great structure to be successful because uh, you don't just go and walk an exhibition uh, and, and immediately find it. Actually, you do tend to see the same product over and over and over again. And when you travel um, international trade shows for 20 years uh, from uh, China, Hong Kong, Shanghai, and then the more um, glamorous one in Paris and Milan, London, New York, uh, you say, wow, yeah, yet again. So the structure. Don't think just at the product. Mm. Don't think of a product to sell, but think of, guess what, the story to tell. And that's what I kept telling my buyers whenever, even from the moment I was recruiting them during the, during the interview process, because it is a process. The buyer is not, uh, is not a shopper. You don't shop for what you like, right? Uh, buying, it is, uh, it is a highly structured environment. You have to think first and foremost of your client's needs. So identify the needs and then think of what product will solve that needs. So provide a solution. That, and I'm getting goosebumps, that so is what gives you a successful product. So obviously you need to understand who they are, who's your customer. There's so much that goes behind it. That's why we need a structure.
And this is so amazing because it's exactly aligned to what I go around and preach. Like-minded women. <laughs> Like-minded women <laughs> connect. It's so true. It's really, mm. it's about your customers, number one, right? What Absolutely. they need. Absolutely. What yeah. they need. And then you, and then the storytelling. Yeah. And then I have structure to that. Uh, don't be afraid of mistakes. Yeah. You know, yet, but sometimes, especially new entrepreneurs, when I had six businesses in oh. different areas. This is my seventh business, you know, right now. When I have a, a, a big team, I have a lot of students, I have a lot of mentors. We work in 22 countries, but it, in Russian language still. But uh, this is seventh. And before, I, I was a bankrupt one time. I had period when I don't have money to pay my bills, like like 20 years ago, you know? So uh, you made mistake, and if you, re re um, if you analyze your mistake, it becomes your experience. And if you just do mistakes, you are fool. <laughs> so yeah. you make mistakes, analyze it, and get more experience. That's what you should do. Absolutely, no, it's, I, I agree with you. Don't be afraid to make mistakes. I call it game.